with the Buddha's uh, description of Anapanasati, to combine those two together. Because last night somebody also asked me to describe the stages of Anapanasati. And by combining the two, I'll hopefully be giving you a perspective which you may not have heard before. I do realize that most of you have listened to my CDs and talks and read my books, so I don't want to repeat what you already know. So the Buddha taught about the 16 stages of Anapanasati. Uh, but first of all, there had to be a preparation. And that preparation was to establish mindfulness. Where it said mindfulness, uh, in English sometimes they translate the word as uh, in front of you. But the word probably means uh, make it a priority. The first thing to establish is mindfulness. And many people go on to their breath far too soon, which means their sati, their mindfulness, is not strong enough to keep the breath in mind. And because they go to the breath far too soon, the only way they can keep their attention on the breath is through too much force. And that means they get lost in uh, a wandering mind, or they get lost in sloth and torpor. They haven't done the preparation. And if you prepare the mind before you start watching the breath, but when you do go on to the breath, it's much easier to hold the breath, to keep it there, without too much effort, which means the mind can become peaceful and still. The breath can stay with you for long periods of time, enough to do its work. So, for each one of us, when we meditate, to first of all establish uh, basic mindfulness before you even start watching the breath. And in the system which I have developed over the years, uh, by teaching myself and teaching others, uh, I developed the uh, stage of present moment awareness and also silence as a means to establish strong mindfulness before I start to invite my breath in as an object of meditation. By present moment awareness, I mean to stop the mind wandering into the future, to stop it lingering on the past, to make that the priority more than anything else. And when you make that the number one priority, to be present, to be here, that you are establishing the first um, strength of mindfulness, that it's right here, it's mindful of what's happening in this moment rather than lingering on what's happened just a moment ago. Whenever you think of the past, you are not aware of the present. Whenever you plan the future, you are not mindful of what's happening now. So you can see that when the mind is in the past or the future, it is not mindful. And secondly, when the mind is thinking, when the mind is giving notes, when the mind is giving things a name, again, it is not fully mindful. As I said last night or the day before, that is like the professor going to the restaurant and eating the menu. That is like the story of Lao Tzu, who made the very powerful point that if you say, what a beautiful sunset, you're not mindful of the sunset, you're mindful of the words. And please understand those points because they are very important to understand what mindfulness is. Mindfulness knows without having to give things a name. Mindfulness knows the thing itself without needing to give it a description. Mindfulness is seeing things as they happen right now. You don't need to write notes about it. You're just right here, in this moment, aware. And if you spend a certain amount of time developing present moment awareness and silence, that will mean the main obstacles to breath meditation are dealt with at the very beginning. It means that when you are watching the breath, the mind won't be wandering off into the past or the future because you've suppressed that tendency of the mind at the very beginning. You find the mind won't be going off into thinking 
because you've suppressed that at the very beginning. You've suppressed the two major obstacles to being aware of the breath. The mind wandering into, wandering into the past and the future and the mind thinking. So noticing those are the two major obstacles to breath meditation, we deal with them first. And when those two are settled, the breath meditation is far easier. So in the simile of the thousand petaled lotus, now you know that a lotus closes up at night time. It becomes like a solid hard bud with all the petals inside. But you may also notice the outermost petal of the lotus is rough, dirty and has got no fragrance to it. You would not know, if you hadn't seen a lotus before, no one would ever expect that inside that rough, dirty, coarse outer petal of the lotus, which is all you can see, that inside is the most fragrant, delicate flowers. But, when the sun rises in the morning and starts to warm that outermost petal of the lotus, it opens up. And inside that unlikely, rough, dirty, unfragrant outermost petal lies the next layer of petals, which are beautiful, which are fragrant, which are soft. And inside that layer of petals, as that opens up in sequence because of the heat of the sun, that too opens up. And inside is an even more fragrant, beautiful and delicate layer of petals. And inside that is the next level, inside that is the next level. And this is the way of meditation. We start with our rough mind, an aching body, an old body, a mind which, and body which is maybe hasn't rested enough because people have been snoring again. Whatever it is, this is how we start. But if we allow our mindfulness to remain on this, it usually opens up. And inside we see what I call the first layer of petals, which is present moment awareness. Whatever you're experiencing, however you feel, sick, healthy, uh, tired or energetic, right inside whatever you're experiencing, right in this moment, is the present, the now. It's in the middle of time. So we center into this thing we call life, time. We come into this present moment. Now when you first observe the present moment, very often it's not pleasant. It's because of unpleasantness at the beginning of present moment awareness that people wander away. They prefer the fantasies which you can create yourself. They prefer the pleasant memories of the past because the present is not uh, enjoyable. Which is why when you first come into the present moment you have to use a lot of patience and kindness. Kindness, maitri, is the ability to be at peace with the unpleasant, to love things which can maybe even harm or, or irritate you. Just like a mother loves her child, even though the child might sword its pants, even though the child might cry at night and wake up the mother, the mother always loves the child, even though the child is very irritating. In the same way, the present moment would usually be irritating when you first watch it. Be patient with it, be kind with it, and soon the present moment will become peaceful, will become pleasant. Give the present moment time to establish itself. This is the layer of petals opening up. And inside the present moment, if you go deep inside that present moment, be really in this very, very moment we call now, then there is no space for any uh, thought or commentary. All the commentary, all the thoughts about something which has just happened. That was nice. That was breath going in. That was my foot moving. You will notice it's in the past. You are giving a commentary on something which has happened and you are neglecting the present. Or it's about something you want to do in the future. 
you'll find if you're right in the middle of the present moment, it's actually impossible to think you're right here. And so in the middle of the present moment, that is like a layer of petals. petals. If you stay in the present moment long enough, it opens up. And inside that present moment you'll find the silence. The silence is something very easy for people to understand once it's pointed out to them. This is a little meditation teacher's trick, which I invite you to use when you're teaching disciples in the future. Because many people these days, whether they live in Colombo or in Perth, in London or in New York, they don't recognize the silent mind. So much so that they are of the opinion that you can't stop thinking. And this little exercise proves to them that yes, you can stop thinking and you show them what it feels like. Now I'm going to do this exercise with you. If you can't understand the English, never mind, but those who can understand my English, I want you to cooperate. Because as I am talking, I also want you to be aware of what's going on in your mind as I'm talking. Because as I'm talking, you will begin to notice some spaces between my words in those gaps, what was going on in your mind. You were aware, but you weren't thinking, because you never knew when I was going to start speaking again. You were waiting silently in the moment. That's what silence there is again. That's what it feels like. It's very helpful to teach people with a little exercise like that what silence feels like. And they realize it's not hard to be silent. They just need to wait in this moment, not running off into the future, not describing things or taking notes. Just being here. And that is a good taste of what mindfulness is and the amount of mindfulness which is necessary to be able to watch the breath with ease. So we establish mindfulness first of all. And then in the first and second steps of Anapanasati, we just know the breath, a long breath or a short breath. I've combined those first two stages. I believe it's a mistake to think one should do long breath first, then short breath afterwards. Sometimes your breath is neither long nor short, it's in the middle. Sometimes it's very long, sometimes it's medium long, sometimes it's only just long. All that particular instruction means is that you know where the breath is going in, sort of long or medium or short, in order to give you something to make the breath more interesting. In other methods of meditation, instead of knowing whether it's a long breath or a short breath, we can count the breath, breathing in one, breathing out one. Or in one method of meditation, which I learned was a student, you breathe in a long breath, deliberately long, and you count nine to that long breath, breathing in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just so that nine coincides with the end of the in-breath. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So you finish when the in-breath finishes. And that has a great uh, advantage of throughout just one breath, one in-breath, one out-breath, you have to do many things, count one to nine, which doesn't give your mind much of a chance to wander off. It is another example of the first two stages of Anapanasati, just to get the mind to know the breath and to give it some extra point of interest, either counting it 
or knowing whether it's long or whether it's short. Uh, obviously there are other methods uh, which you can use other than counting. And one of those is using mantras along with the breath. Many of you know the famous Thai forest mantra of using buddho with the breath. As you're breathing in, you chant bud silently to yourself as you breathe out to, buddho. Because many Northeast Thais were so faithful, the word Buddha had such an important meaning to them, that it made the breath very interesting, as they were chanting Buddha, Buddha, along with the breath. And of course there are many other mantras which you can use. You don't have to just use uh, that mantra. In fact, you can uh, use your own mantra. One of my disciples in Perth, uh, used a mantra which was very effective for them. So they, as they breathed in, they mentioned the word peace. As they breathed out, let go. Peace, let go. Peace, let go. Breathing in, peace. Breathing out, letting go. And what that did when they kept repeating that very simple instruction to themselves with every breath, any psychologist knows that you will uh, have some more peace, you will let go because you are conditioning yourself to do that with every breath, breathing in peace, breathing out let go, breathing in peace, breathing out let go. So that worked for them. So I encourage you if you are doing breath meditation to experiment to maybe use a traditional mantra or to make up your own mantra, which helps you stick with the breath at the very beginning. The point is, you're making the breath interesting. Interesting so it's easy to pay attention to. Because without that interest at the very beginning, the mind gets bored and you start picking up the past or the future. Or you start just falling asleep because the breath is not interesting for you. So you can start with that. One point which I have to make is that you do not need to watch the breath at the tip of the nose or the belly or anywhere else. Remember the Buddha said to know the breath going in, going out. He never said where. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, I think last night in the um, questions, when I was a very young uh, meditator, still a lay person, I suffered from hay fever, uh, <coughs> Tina Puparoga, in the commentaries. Apparently that they knew about it in India uh, 1500 years ago. It's the, the sickness of grass and flowers. In other words, the pollen gives you a reaction which makes the mucus come out of your nose and your nose soon gets blocked. And that happened to me so much that in many times of the year I could not watch the breath at the tip of my nose. The reason was my whole nose was blocked, so I could not breathe that way. And I thought that meant I would never be able to be a good meditator. But actually it helped me. Because I realized that you don't need to watch the breath at the tip of the nose. Wherever the breath is happening you can watch it there. In fact I've taught many people don't even be concerned about where the breath uh, exists, where it occurs. As long as you know the breath is going in, as long as you know it's going out, you don't need to know where it's going in or where it's going out. And in fact that helped me enormously because I just knew breath going in or I knew breath going out and I had no idea where in my body that was occurring. It helped me let go of the physical sensations of the body very easily. If you're watching the tip of the nose, it means that you have body awareness. You, that fifth sense is turned on, which makes it very hard for you to let go of the pain in your knees or in the itch on your head. But if you turn off the body awareness early, you just know the breath is going in, breath is going out, and you don't know where, it's very easy to also ignore the aches and pains elsewhere in your body. You're letting go of the bodily sensation, the bodily sense, that uh, bodily ayatana, 
very quickly. So it helps. So even these days, when I watch the breath, I don't know where the breath is happening. It's just going in, going out. I remember on one occasion, just for an experiment, my breath was getting very smooth and peaceful. And I interrupted my meditation and asked, where is the breath being felt right now? And as soon as I asked that question, it was at the tip of my nose. But when I never asked the question, I knew the breath was going in and going out, but I didn't know where. It is very common, I think, for nearly all meditators, not all, but nearly all, that when the breath settles down and the breath is peaceful, it is noticed here. But let that happen naturally. Do not force it. Some meditators watch the tip of the nose, they can't find the breath. And there's a good reason why, because it's not there, it's somewhere else. Other meditators watch the tip of the nose and they get headache. And there is a reason why. And I will now demonstrate this. I have to take off my glasses first of all to demonstrate this. Now when you are watching, uh, when you are being aware of any part of your body, the psychology of the mind is whatever your mind is aware of, your, your eyes look at. So if you're actually watching the tip of the nose, you've got your eyelids closed, I'm going to watch the tip of the, uh, the nose with my eyelids open, because this is what you're doing. You'll be watching the tip of your nose, and underneath your eyelids, if I could peel them back, you'll be cross-eyed like this. And you can imagine, if you keep cross-eyed like that for half an hour, you're going to get a big headache across here. And, <laughs> and this is true, many meditators complain about headache across here. And the reason is that focusing so much on the tip of the nose, the eyes are strained, also watching. You're not aware of that, because you're watching the breath, not your eyeballs. But you'll find that's what the eyeballs are doing. So it's much more helpful just to be aware of the breath, and don't care where that breath happens to be located. Then it becomes, again, much easier. So you're watching the breath. This is where the silence opens out, and in that layer of petals, right in the middle of the silence, is the breath. That is one of the best ways of meditating, where you don't choose to watch the breath, but the breath comes into your mind by itself. Because you're in the present moment, because you're silent, not thinking, because you're sitting still, basically that's the only thing moving. So that's why you're aware of it. The layer of petals of the breath lies right inside the silence, inside the present moment. Now the beauty of the simile of the lotus is you don't need to move on to another lotus. You don't go on to another stage of meditation. You stay where you are. You don't move. And you go deeper into the stage where you are now. And right in the middle of the stage you're in now is the next stage. You don't throw things away to go on to the next stage. It's not like moving from one room of a house into another room. It's like you stay in the room you already are in and go to the middle of that room where you find the next room. So you never go on to the next stage of meditation. You always go in to the next stage. And the next stage is always right in the middle of where you are now. The next layer of petals is in the one you see now. You just need to open it up with patience and mindfulness. That's what opens up the petals. So with patience and mindfulness, you're in this watching the breath. Just the breath going in, the breath going out. And of course you can understand, you've probably experienced this many times yourselves. But first of all, you may just notice the breath going in, the breath going out. You may be sort of counting the breath, you may be doing a mantra with the breath. But after a while you see more and more and more of the breath. As the mindfulness becomes stronger, you see more of what you're watching. And this is where you start to be able to notice the very first sensation of the in-breath. When the in-breath just begins, there's a particular sensation of the beginning of the in-breath. And that's followed by another sensation, another sensation, another sensation. As the in-breath continues 
its process until it gets to what I perceive as the peak, the strongest sensation of the in-breath and then it starts to fade away. For my in-breath, the peak is about three-quarters of the way through the breath. So it builds and builds and builds to its peak and then it quite quickly fades away again. And you can notice that last sensation of an in-breath before the in-breath stops and there's a pause. The out-breath does not begin immediately once the in-breath is finished. There's a pause there, and you notice that pause. It's very important as a meditator, if you want to go to deep meditation, to notice pauses. To be able to be aware when there's nothing happening. Because that is a great skill which will help you later on in meditation. You don't always need to be aware of things occurring. To be aware of emptiness, of vanishing, of things have disappeared and be able to stay with that long enough to be able to understand it. So you're aware of this pause, this gap between the in-breath and the out-breath and then you see the birth of the out-breath, the first sensation when an out-breath begins. And see that too, grow, grow, grow as there's thousands of sensations in one out-breath. And you notice many of them until the out-breath is finished and then there's another pause. This is being aware of the full body of the breath, the third stage of Anapana Sati, Sabakaya Patisavvedi. As many people know that Sabakaya Patisavvedi doesn't mean you're aware of your physical body, it means that particular body called the breath, that particular process called breathing the whole sequence of breathing, from the beginning to the end. And you will know now that your mind is so full with these sensations, it's very difficult to have any space for a thought or even sounds from outside, because if you're aware of a sound, you're not aware of the breath. If you're aware of a feeling in the body, you're not aware of the breathing. If you're aware of a thought, you've lost the breath. And very often you may lose the breath a little bit, but you're mostly aware of the breath. Until you're aware of so many sensations of the breath, that's another layer of petals has opened up. The full awareness of the breath, the Sabakaya Padi Sangwedi, that exists in just the ordinary in-breath and out-breath. It's just a development. You don't need to think, Oh, I've been watching the in-breath and out-breath, now I will go on to the next stage. These all happen quite naturally. You're just being aware, you're being patient, and these petals open up one after the other. The next thing which happens, according to the fourth stage of Anapanasati, you have to calm that bodily, uh, and that bodily sankhara. And of course, you don't do this uh, through an act of will, it happens quite naturally. As you're watching the breath, the full awareness of the breath, it calms down, it becomes more still because you are not interfering, you're not doing anything. Remember the way to get a glass of water perfectly still is not to hold it still, but to put it down. The way to calm that bodily function called the breathing is not to try and calm it down, but to let it calm down by itself. That's like a leaf, its natural state is to be calm. You leave it alone, and it becomes calm. An example of this, again an old teacher's example, is I want you all now to be aware of the saliva in your throat, or in your mouth. Now it's a problem. A minute ago, your saliva was no problem at all, it was peaceful. But once you become aware of something, the nature of the mind is to interfere with it and try and control it. Now you're aware of your saliva, it's a problem because you have to control it. You wonder whether you should swallow or not, or what you should do with it. That is the nature of the mind, what it's aware of, it interferes with. So when you're first aware of this breath, you are interfering with it, you have to let it go. Find out why you're trying to make it this way or that way. Put it down and you know you've let it go when the breath becomes very smooth. You know you've let the saliva go when it's natural again, it's not a problem anymore. So when the breath calms down and it gets very peaceful, just breathing in, breathing out, 
effortless and comfortable. It's another layer of petals has opened up. Now you're in a very full awareness of a very peaceful and calm breath. There's a danger at this point in Anapanasati. But if your mindfulness is not strong enough, you might go asleep. You might go into dullness. Why? It's because there's nothing much to excite the mind. The sensation of a calm breath is very subtle. And if the mindfulness is not subtle enough to know such things, it will just turn off. Which is why it's important to try and move on to the fifth stage as soon as possible to somehow even generate the fifth and sixth stages of Anapanasati, which is Piti Sukha, to have a delightful breath. Because once a delight is there with the breathing, once it's a beautiful breath, a delightful breath, the chances of you falling asleep are reduced enormously. And there are some tricks to be able to get to the, from the fourth stage to the fifth and sixth stage very quickly. One of the ways is to stop developing fault-finding minds. A fault-finding mind is a mind which always sees the mistakes and the errors and the things which are wrong anywhere in life. An example of this, again from my story of being an abbot and teacher in a monastery in the West. And for those who know me, I do have many, many, many duties. Not only a monastery to run, but also a city centre for lay people. And my life used to be on Friday afternoon going to a city centre and looking after the administration, the counselling, the teaching and everything else in this big centre, one acre property in Perth. And Sunday afternoon, having finished all the teaching, counselling, administration and everything else, go back to a monastery in Serpentine and then look after the monks and the building, administration and teaching in the monastery. It was weekends in one workplace and the rest of the week in another workplace. And I noticed that visitors who would come to the monastery where I lived would always enjoy it and say, what a beautiful place this is. And I would say, what? Can't you see all the things which need to be done? It might be okay for you, you're on holiday here, but this is my workplace. And I realised I was not enjoying the monastery in which I lived. And I made a resolution that every Monday morning I would have a walk around the monastery in which I lived, not as an abbot or a teacher, but having the mind of a visitor. Because I was a visitor, I saw all the beautiful things in that monastery. If I was an abbot, a teacher, I saw all the things which needed to be fixed. As a teacher, as an administrator, as an abbot, I had to have a fault-finding mind. I had to see the things which were wrong and fix them. As a visitor, I just see the things which were right and enjoy them. And I notice that many of our, much of our life is like that. It's much better to have the mind of a visitor <laughs> than a manager. So in my meditation, I did exactly the same. Instead of seeing all the faults in my meditation, I'd only got as far as just full awareness of the breath. No limiters, you hopeless monk, you should know better than this. That was a manager and fault finder. And that stopped me going deeper. And then I had a visitor, like I imagine myself being a new meditator. I got to full awareness of the breath, that's brilliant, well done. And I had so much gratitude that I got to the next stage very quickly. If you have a fault finding mind, it's very hard to progress in meditation. You always see the wrong, you never see the beauty. So even in this meditation retreat, I don't know, there may be many things wrong. There may be many things you were complaining about already. That's called a fault-finding mind. You may be complaining about the other monks in this retreat, the lay people, the nuns, the women, the organisation, the food, the rain, the cold. If you have a fault-finding mind, you'll never get any pity sukha. So instead, change the mind, instead of fault-finding. What a wonderful thing this is, that you can come on a retreat, especially you lay people. You're very special, this is supposed to be just for monks. So the fact you're here today should give you so much joy. 
and so grateful that you shouldn't have any complaints at all. And you monks, the fact you've come here and you're being supported, looked after, isn't a wonderful thing. Yeah, it could be better, but it's pretty good as it is. And if you develop the opposite of the fault-finding mind, the mind of gratitude, it's much easier to develop piti sukha. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're grateful and you can see happiness and joy so easily. So if you develop the happy mind during the day, happy that you have food to eat today, happy you've got a place to stay, happy that yes it's raining but you've got an umbrella, that happy mind, that positive mind is very important to help you progress very quickly into the deeper stages of meditation. Many meditators are afraid of happiness. Unfortunately that some teachers, and really they should know better, have kept on saying, be careful of happiness in meditation, you'll get attached and you will not be able to proceed into deep meditation. And I think each one of you know the teaching of the Buddha well enough to know the sutras. And you can see in so many places, I quoted the other day the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, where the Buddha said there are two types of happiness, two types of pleasure. There's Karma Sukha, which is the pleasures of the, uh, the body of the world. And he said that's called Milha Sukha, like urine. You should not sort of follow sort of such happiness as a monk. But then there is the happinesses of the mind, in particular the four jhanas, which the Buddha said, they should not be feared, that they should be developed, they should be followed, they should be made much of. He made a point of encouraging monks, nuns, upasikas, upasikas, who are interested in developing their minds, to encourage, establish, to follow and develop the inner happinesses of the mind. So please keep looking that up until you are totally convinced that it is advisable, it is encouraged by the Buddha to develop the Piti Sukha, especially which is developed at this stage of meditation. So you're not afraid of it. In fact, you look for it, you encourage it. When it happens, well done. You're opening up another layer in the petals. So what usually happens from the stage of full awareness of the breathing, from the beginning to the end, quite naturally it starts to get happy as long as you're looking for it, as long as you're aware of it and when it happens you don't reject it. The Piti Sukha are coming up. And when you open up those layer of petals, that's when the petals become very beautiful and fragrant. And because the meditation, the breath is so delightful, you can sit meditation for a long period of time, without any effort. In fact, it's hard to get out of the meditation. Many of my students who are on retreats such as this, where they have to keep eight precepts, the bell goes for lunch. Now these are lay people who live in the world of the five senses and who like their food. Sri Lankans, you like eating. All Asians like eating. Wherever you go in Asia, whatever time of the day or night, even the middle of the night, sometimes my flight arrives late at night, there's always restaurants with people eating in it. One, two, three o'clock in the morning. There was a retreat I gave in Malacca in early November. And I had some disciples from Singapore, Malacca is in Malaysia, come. And after the last uh, talk and meditation finished at 10 o'clock, they weren't, they were on five precepts. What did they do? They went out for supper. And because they were at supper, when they came into the meditation center, it, the gate was locked. They came back 11.30 and they had to climb over the gate to get back in. <laughs> it's impossible to stop Chinese people eating in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I think maybe Sri Lankan people as well sometimes. You love eating. Now imagine a person like that when it gets to 11 o'clock and the bell for dana, and they're having a wonderful meditation, and they have to choose a conscious choice between having lunch or staying in their meditation, 
and knowing they're not going to eat until the following day. And so many people carry on meditating. They're having such a wonderful time, they'd rather go without food than go without their meditation. Now I hope that happens to some of you monks. I'd be very disappointed if each one of you, every day, lines up for the lunch dinner. <laughs> that shows you you've got some pity sukha coming up. Having such a wonderful meditation, who cares about lunch? Now that's the level of pity sukha which is coming up. It's so nice, so wonderful. Now it's because you have such pity sukha that obviously the mind is not going to wander anywhere. It's not going to wander away for lunch because it's just too enjoyable, just watching this breath go in and go out, and it's gorgeous. Having the most wonderful time. And because of that you sit for many hours sometimes. And you get out uh, from the meditation, oh that was really, really nice. You look at the clock, my goodness, three hours have gone past. And you haven't got any sort of aches and pains. It's natural, you haven't forced yourself. You're not trying to get into the Guinness Book of Records from the meditator who could sit the longest. This is just natural. And when this happens naturally, it shows that Piti Sukha is coming up. Now you're getting into the, the really good meditations. I've been teaching for a long time that once you get to that fifth and sixth stage of meditation, then great, you're off. I don't need to do very much. Just give you a little bit of um, instructions now and again. But once you get Piti Sukha coming up, you're going to have a great time. And you're really going to meditate a lot. Why? because you're enjoying it enormously. One of the most wonderful things you can do. Yes, you're going to get attached. What a wonderful thing it is to get attached to meditation. It's much better to get attached to meditation than be getting attached to girls. <laughs> TV, money, or whatever else you get attached to. Sure it is, attachment to the pleasures of the mind will stop you becoming an arahat. But it won't stop you becoming an anagami. I think many of you will be very happy if in this life you reach an anagami. So don't worry about the attachment to the pleasures of the mind. It's the other attachments which are the problems, not the attachments to the pleasures of the mind. So go for it, get into it. And that pleasure, quite naturally, just calms down by itself. The seventh stage of anapanasati. Now you notice I haven't distinguished between the piti sukha stage. Because basically it's very difficult to, to distinguish piti sukha. And I state here the only time that anyone is competent to distinguish from piti and sukha is if they've got a third jhana. And that's the only time that piti disappears. And now you know what piti was and what sukha is. So this stage is just joyful, it's happy, enjoy it. Sometimes that joy can get a bit too exciting, which means that you know you the meditation starts to fall apart. So just keep it calm, get that type of joy and happiness which you can maintain for long periods of time, a very smooth and joyful happiness. Oh, sorry, the, so that I've uh, missed the seventh stage, which is just experiencing the, the whole uh, Jitta Sankara, the, uh, the feeling of Piti Sukha, and then calming it down is the eighth. Now remember on those for fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth stage of Anapanasati, the main object which you're watching is not so much the breath, but the pleasure of the breath. So you're not really watching the breath going in and going out. You notice this beautiful delight, how delightful it is. That is the main object of your mind, delight. And because that's the main object of your mind, that particular perception associated with the breath of delight, the physical feeling is starting to disappear. And what you're watching is a delightful feeling instead. And as that starts to disappear in the eighth stage, as the you uh, uh, Pasambayang, the Kayasang, the Chitta Sankara, the Chitta Sankara is the pleasure, the bliss. As that starts to calm down, so does the breath disappear you're not aware of the breathing in or breathing out anymore. Now sometimes that people develop their meditation skipping the pleasure parts. You get a very, very peaceful breath and it disappears and you're lost. And the reason why you're lost because you didn't develop the joyful part.
part of the breathing. If you develop the joyful part of the breathing, it's a sign your mindfulness is getting stronger and stronger and stronger because the joy of the mind is the strength of mindfulness. Later on I'll give a talk about mindfulness and how it develops in meditation and how the very powerful mindfulness is not only can be see very deeply into things but also experience a lot of joy and happiness. The sign of a powerful state of mindfulness is the joy. Just the mind's energy is happiness. So as the mind becomes very, very joyful, if the breath disappears then, you still have something to watch. The joy, the pleasure of the mind. And it's at that stage that this nimitta starts to arise. The ninth stage of anapanasati, chittapati sangwedi. The pabhasara jitta, without the hindrances, beautiful, brilliant. There may still be a few lingering hindrances there, Sometimes the hindrance which really comes up the first time you see a nimitta, as many of you have already told me, is doubt, the wichikicha. Is this a real nimitta? Am I imagining this? Is this somebody shining a light into my eyes? It's, a, it's astounding how many people have doubt when nimitta comes. And sometimes you ask why. And I think especially for many Westerners you have low self-esteem. You think that you know, a person like me can't get nimitters. They are nimitters. They are real. Ninety-nine. This is just uh, from my own experience. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, it's real nimitters. So you can trust that what you're seeing is a real light. But if you have been practicing according to the steps of Anapanasati, it's already quite joyful because the breath has been joyful. So it's quite brilliant. What's happening here? As this, go back to the simile of the lotus, this uh, full awareness of the breath, it opens up into these beautiful lotus petals, the PT layer of petals, the sukha layer of petals, the very refined PT sukha levels, as you start to calm down. And the next stage is right in the one you're in now. So don't move and think, I've got this stage, what should I do to get to the next stage? Well, the answer to that question is, what should you do to ne go to the next stage is nothing. Be mindful and wait. Be patient. The petals open up by themselves. You can't force them open. Don't do anything. Be still, be mindful, and petals open up one after the other in a natural progression. If you do something, you're moving on from where you are to something else. Your mindfulness has moved. It's not shining on this layer of petals. So keep still, mindfulness is opening up more petals. And of course it opens up this incredible layer of petals called the nimitta. Beautiful, beautiful um, light in the mind. It does not matter what colour that light is. It does not matter its shape. It does not matter what it's doing. The two things which are very important about a nimitta are its stability, the fact it stays, and doesn't just flash up and disappear again and also its brilliance, its beauty, its amount of pity sukha. That's why the, uh, the tenth and eleventh stages of Anapanasati is Abhipamojiyang Jitang, which is just to get, bring more delight to that nimitta. What I said in English, to shine it up, to make it even more beautiful and radiant. And the other one is to stabilize it, so it's not moving around, it's not flashing and then disappearing again. So it stays with you a long time. Now those are very hard things for meditators to do. How do you do that? By doing nothing. Because when my nimitta started to come up, they'd always move backwards and forwards, and it was just so struggle to try and keep them still. And then I realized the insight which helped me enormously was the nimitta was like looking at your face in a mirror. I, the mind was looking at itself in a mirror. That nimitta was the jitta, or how I perceived the jitta. And if you, uh, uh, if in your room you have a mirror, in my bathroom there is a mirror, because this is a lay people's hotel. If you have a mirror in your bathroom, and you look at your face in that mirror, and if that face is moving backwards and forwards in the mirror, if you try and hold the mirror still, is that going to help? 
And that's because the one who's watching is moving. Doesn't matter how hard you hold that mirror, if you're moving backwards and forwards, the image in the mirror is going to move. So if you want to keep that nimitta still, the one that is watching, that has to be still. The observer, the mindfulness, that has to be totally still. Otherwise, the nimitta will keep on moving. So if you react with excitement, with ill will, so not excitement, with fear, and you try and control that nimitta, you'll be moving and you'll disturb it. You've got so far by letting go, by being still. Just carry on. Don't change what you've been doing. It's working. I don't know how many people, they get to the nimitta stage, they've been doing the meditation perfectly, and the last minute they try and control it. And this is why they don't get into the jhanas. Nimitta comes up, be still with it. Leave it alone. Relax. And you find the nimitta becomes still. As for shining up that nimitta, someone said last night, if you've got bad sila, can you get into jhanas? Uh, you can. I know from experience this does happen. I know some scallywags. A scallywag is an English term for people whose sila could be much better. But they've got so much wisdom and skill, yeah, they can use their wisdom to overcome the weakness in their sila. And I know how they do it. They told me that when you have a nimitta, you know, parts of it are bright, parts of it are dirty. If you have a dirty nimitta, it means that your sila is not pure. You're seeing a reflection of your mind. And this is actually how you see the power of sila. Because if you've been practicing sila for a long time, your jitta is brilliant and beautiful. When it first comes up in meditation, it's gorgeous. If it is, well done, your sila has been good. But sometimes, that because of our defilements, we can be dishonest with ourselves and think, oh, it doesn't really matter, it's only a small, a small error in sila, it doesn't really matter. But when you get the nimitta, it does, you can see it. You can't be dishonest with yourself. You're looking at your jitta with nothing in between, so you see it honestly. But, even if you have a dirty nit, uh, nimitta, there's always one part of it which is beautiful. If you develop not the fault finding mind, but the, the mind which can look for the beauty, the mind can go to the beautiful part. And in the middle of that beautiful part, it gets more beautiful. In the middle of that more beautiful, it gets more beautiful. It's as if the nimitta expands, the beautiful part expands, and pushes all the dirty part away. However, it's much easier if you have beautiful nimittas, because you've had really good sila. And for my lay meditators, because I've known many of these for a long period of time, it's got to the point now I can almost predict, you know, when a lay meditator, when they get to that particular stage, who's going to get the beautiful nimittas? You all know lay people, lay diakers, supporters, <coughs> who will do anything for you, who are just so generous and so kind, who would stop what they're doing to help you, but for the Dhamma. They never ask for anything back in return. They never go praising themselves or saying what a good person they are. Those type of people, selfless, pure, virtuous, generous and kind, they're the people who when they get to nimitta stage have a very easy time because their nimittas are incredibly beautiful. They've got such a pure heart, that's what they see. So those of you who are doing service for the sasana, Venerable Metta Wihari, <laughs> I can see you over there. <laughs> because of all your giving and all of your good work, it means that you've given so much you know, for the sasana, and uh, doing the, the Buddha channel and everything else. And when your nimitta comes up, wow, it's incredible, really beautiful. This is where you get the payback for everything you've sacrificed. And when you get beautiful nimittas there, and they're stable, the next stage happens automatically. This beautiful nimitta stage of meditation, the petals open out. You fall in. Which is the experience which people have when they have these incredibly powerful nimittas. They just can't stop themselves. They get drawn into the center. It gets brighter and brighter, more and more beautiful. Or they feel it's enveloping them. And if they stay inside, they get an incredible bliss, which is the first jhana experience. 
Many people, again, are afraid of such a pleasure. Even the Buddha was. If you look at Mahasattaka Sutta, the Buddha's Bodhisattva, so it's not a Buddha yet, said, why am I afraid of that pleasure when he recalled the jhana he got under the rose apple tree? It's powerful. The reason you're afraid is because many things disappear. Many of your attachments have to be left outside. And that's fearful, to lose total control. It is to totally let go and have trust in this very, very powerful, blissful experience. It's the reason why I teach like this, so you have nothing to fear. You've read about the jhanas in the suttas. These are incredible experiences. It's one of the reasons why you become monks, why you become nuns, why you're here today. To get the benefit of renunciation. Because the first jhana, one of its descriptions is Nekamasukha, the bliss of renunciation. You've all given up so much. You've given up the bliss of sex, of movies, of getting the food you like. You've given up so much. This is the payback, the return, the bliss of the deep jhanas. So the petals have opened up, an incredibly beautiful set of petals of the jhana. And inside that first jhana, you don't move on to a second jhana. You just are in that first jhana and the petals open up and inside is an incredibly beautiful second jhana. Inside that is the third, inside that the fourth. Inside the fourth jhana, after a while the fourth jhana, you think that's the ultimate, you can't go more than that, but it opens up and there you have the first arupa. And you stay there for however long and that opens up and you're going deeper and deeper in. This is the experience of what happens. Yeah, sure, if you have experience of these states before you enter, then you can make Adhisthana. I will get into the second Arupa or whatever. And then that would work. But for the first times anyway, you can't make an Adhitana when you don't know what you're Adhitana for. You haven't got experience of what these jhanas are, what the Arupas are. They happen naturally, they just go in, in, in. The petals unfold and unfold as you go deeper in. That is actually the way the meditation works. I've only got to the twelfth stage of anapana, vimochiyam freeing the mind. Freeing the mind from what? Freeing the mind totally from the five senses. Freeing the mind from the hindrances. There you're in the jhanas. Was it vivichehi kamehi, vivichakusalehi damehi? Free from the five senses and free from the unwholesome dhammas, always described as the five hypnotists. Having an enormous amount of pleasure, still peaceful. And later on I'll show, tell you how, when you come out afterwards, that gives you the evidence to understand what the Buddha taught, the basis for insight. So that's how Anapanasati works. To sum up the talk, the most important part of this talk, or two important parts, is first of all, you don't need to go on to the next stage of meditation. Any of you who ask, I've got to this stage, what do I do next? That is a wrong question. You got to this stage, stay there. Don't try to go on to another stage. Go deeper into that stage. Stay where you are. And then you'll go to the next stage. Don't destroy what you've done already by trying to get somewhere else. Stay where you are. The next stage will come to you. From right within where you already are. That's such an important teaching in meditation. That will help you enormously. It means wherever you're experiencing meditation, wonderful, fine, stay there. Sloth and torpor, stay there. Don't try and get rid of it. Stay long enough and in the middle of sloth and torpor comes a very delightful breath. It's in the middle, so don't move. Keep still. Or in the middle of, so if you've got a nimitta, what do I do next? What do I do with this nimitta? Stay there, don't do anything. When you're still, the nimitta is still. And when the nimitra is still, it just grows in power. And please don't be afraid. Because sometimes the power of the nimitra is so great 
that even recently someone told me they thought they're going to go blind. So because it's a mental object, it's not a physical object, it's not affecting the eye at all. Incredibly powerful, beautiful. And sometimes you think you can't take so much happiness. Well, it must be wrong. I'm a monk. I'm not supposed to have bliss. You are. Enjoy. This is the pleasures of the monkhood. And you get even deeper and understand how those pleasures translate into Magham Pala. Similarly, the lotus makes it very clear. The next stage is in the one you're in now. And that's how Anapanasati works. The second point, which is important, is don't be afraid of the pleasure. Develop it. Don't have a fault-finding mind in monastic life. Be a mind, have a mind of gratitude, which doesn't find fault with other monks who are in your room. They may be sleepy, they may be not meditating, but just be kind to them. They're doing their very best. And feel wonderful. You're a monk, you've come on this retreat, well done. So have this beautiful positive mind, because if you have that positive mind, you will be looking for joy and happiness. And that joy and happiness will be there for you at the right stage. You'll be able to see the joyful breath. And you won't throw it away. And that will take you into very nice meditations. So that's the talk for this morning on Anapanasati together with uh, the simile of the Thousand Petal Lotus.